looking at young, the early teenagers, well, they have different habits. For instance, uh, Metaverse is considered one of the potential big game changers in terms of communication channels, digital services. But Metaverse is something that should be regarded as potential changers for payment industry, for finance industry. When you look at all these young generations, they spend time in platforms, Roblox or Minecraft or Fortnite. Not that much play, games, but also to meet, to interact. If Metaverse will be another channel that's going to be important for this new generation, and they're already doing it. So maybe they'll be buying things in that Metaverse. These could be digital things, and they need to store them, and they need to pay for them somewhere. Interesting. And actually, they're making money. You can make money in Roblox. You can make games and make people. There's a creator economy. So it's like... There's going to be economy inside these metaverse platforms. And if there's economy, guess what? You need financial services. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Purpose Driven Fintech Podcast, where we learn how to build fintech products with customer and commercial impact because we're on a mission to eliminate financial stress. Thanks to every single one of you that comes back every week to listen, learn, and get inspired. My guest today is Pavel Stesigi. Senior Fintech and Banking Consultant at NetGuru. We talk about the future of Fintech in 2030. We first set context on the how to go about thinking about the future. We discuss how to go about finding underserved needs. We then go deep into what he sees as the top three opportunities, banking in Middle Eastern Africa, SME banking, and the alpha generation. Yes, the teenagers of today are the customers of tomorrow, but guess what? What a similar... Oh. But guess what? A seamless banking app will not be enough for them. The big bet is they will hang out in the metaverse, but it's a new place to hang out. And as such, payments and money movements will play a big part. We then finish with how to create differentiated propositions and a different approach to solving diversity issues that I loved. So if you enjoyed the episode, it could mean the world if you Give it a follow, subscribe, like, and share, DM me, you know. Thank you. Let's go into it. Hi, Pavel. How are you? It's awesome having you in the show. Really excited for our conversation. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. I'm also looking forward to it. It's also incredible to connect with the other part of the world, just like that, sitting somewhere at the lake and then talking to you somewhere in Southeast Asia. Yes. And before we go into full fintech and product, exciting conversations. First, I want to ask you two questions just to get to know you a little bit on more on the personal side. So what is your definition of success? So uh, I, I guess that's personal. So personally, I would say that success is being all over in, in the areas that I consider important. Like, you know, sometimes with teams, you've been a radar of skills for people in the team. So my definition mm -hmm. of success would, have, would be uh, to have this radar covering pretty large area, right? So some people define success as being extremely successful in one area and they're probably the best on the planet doing that. I would say having a right balance, life, work, people that I like to do, more or less changing that. So yeah, controlling that radar of your personal and business career, that would be a success. Yes. It's important that it's not just career. It has to be personal life too. So talking about careers, if you look back at your career, what is the advice you wish someone gave you at the beginning of your career? Yeah, I, I wish I talked to people who are much older than I was back then. For some reason, I would mostly talk to pe people being pretty much the same age as I was, which doesn't really might make much sense because talk to people we have more experience. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I got this advice to focus on industries and uh, jobs and opportunities that have a good future ahead. If you look at the industry that's growing in five, 10 years time, bet on it. Like, bet on the industries that will support your growth because they're growing too. That's the best advice I would say we can get. But I know some people mm -hmm. who get too focused on industry, which is stagnant. And then it's really hard to achieve there. And talk to the older yes, ones, not the people okay. in your age, because 
they haven't seen what lies in front of you. Yeah, I like that idea because exactly people have, it may not be the exact term, same trajectory, but they have lived more, have more experience, more perspective. So that's very helpful. Okay, so let's get into the conversation. This podcast is about purpose and product making impact, basically. In your opinion, how can we ensure that we as fintechs build an industry where we have more impact? Yeah, I would say three things. You make an impact in industry where there is demand, right? So um, there are countries and areas in the world when there is still a huge demand for services. You get underserved customers. There are pain points, you know, needs that needs to be solved. So go there and you'll make an impact. I mean, go into the, the areas where they need you, right? Obviously, then you make an impact. So that's the mm. first one. Consider where there are underserved communities, right? Look for um, partnerships and growing together, not necessarily as tech, because people don't need fintech. They need to get to save money or to make a payment or sometimes to buy things, right? So consider partnerships and that's good with open finance becoming more and more of thing. So grow together with partners and then hopefully look in the longer perspective because in the longer perspective, there might be a bigger impact. Sometimes fintechs, they are too focused on this one year short perspective and they go, go, go up fast and then they go down and then they go up. So maybe less of a bumpy road, Down. more consistent growth. I love that as a concept. And I think it's like, you nailed it. It's a good point. We as fintechs are focused on the short term because we need to survive. See? Yep. So maybe a little bit of perspective into long-term thinking will also help the industry. <laughs> but it doesn't take away the fact that we need to survive. <laughs> so, but it's a good challenge for all of us. So. Let's go back to you. How did you get into product and how did you get into NetGuru? I guess it's a longer story, but it started uh, with research like more than 15 years ago. I would work in research, but uh, like a proper research, you know, the user not so much user testing back then, but exploring products, market segments, mostly with new technologies. So for instance, we would test digital TV before there was Netflix, right? So we would test, we would actually test the contactless cards, which was kind of funny because no one used contactless 15 years. Talk to the users, we would uh, work with Visa and then get feedback from people who started using cards and they didn't want that. I mean, they said, why should we use that contactless? Maybe I can use the, the pin pads put in the card. So that's not me that's, you know, Listen to the users, but then consider uh, their understanding. Maybe uh, you need to filter what they say to, to consider the bigger picture, right? If I would ask users, do they want faster or more convenient mm -hmm. payment? Yeah. Do you, they want contactless payments? Well, why should I? And so I started with research. Then I went to yes. research in, in R&D with Citibank for some time where we worked on new mm -hmm. products for City. And then I moved more into not only research, but also design, product design. Uh, I, I set up a lab, innovation lab in a Polish bag, and we would test and design new products for different markets, not only Poland. Work with you, mm, trying to innovate in number of ways to add value to the product in consumer or SME banking. And at some point I moved on to digital uh, consultancy, which is NetGuru mostly, where I support products for clients all over the world, mostly in EMEA, where we design, help to create digital products, apps or neobanks or payment solutions, or also like we also do for retail. Sometimes there is a retail component in the in a financial component in retail. So long story short, it started with research when I added research. design and product design. And right now I'm working in an IT consultancy. Yes. And I find that fascinating because it seems like since the beginning of your career, you were in this area, right? The, the somehow related to customers, whether that's research, understanding the industry, but you've also talked about the big picture a few times in our first few minutes, which I love. That makes it like a very unique combination in your brain as in you're close to customers, but at the same time, it's like, remember the big picture. It, it, there is a business perspective within each product, 
actually, initially I graduated the business administration. So there is a customer perspective, mm-hmm. but to make it a business case, you need to see, look at how this product will deliver value to the company and to the stakeholders. So it's useful to some extent to look at this very detailed use case insights from the users. I don't know, people being happy to see that their kids are starting to use mm-hmm. uh, some learning with their mobile banking app or something like that. But then the big picture, obviously, if you, in this case would be having a strategy for building a future base of users, kids of uh, current parents using banking services. So there's al- always, there is a big picture there's a, and there is a customer in the end. Yeah. And then just to build on that, recently you did a keynote that was titled Future Users of Financial Services, Horizon 2030 in EMEA, which basically it's elaborates on what you're talking about kids, right? Like the kids today are the future users. I found that like fascinating because like, I think at least myself and people who are in the trenches in fintech, like we said at the beginning, we're very focused on day to day rather than 2030. 2030 seems so far away, but you have done that work. Can you guide us through the, how did you go about identifying what will be the next thing in demand? What's the opportunity? Like, can you guide us through your thinking process? Sure. I like this approach. I mean, it's, it's like natural for all of us to be focused on daily work. There is like, I think it's McKinsey's approach with horizon one, horizon two and horizon three perspective. Horizons one being this year, maybe like the next one. And allegedly like 95, 97 of employees in the companies are focused on that. It all focused on this um, current perspective. But then there is the horizon two, which is more three, five years. The board members look into that, strategy teams look into that. And then there is this five plus 10 years perspective, which is more of a job for innovation labs to think of that perspective. And in that 10 years perspective. I mean, it can still seem crazy, but it's possible that there's going to be a change that will mess up your business, take down to your business totally. So you pay people, and I used to be in this place in the innovation labs, pay people to try to look for, on one hand, Mm -hmm. trends, some technologies, opportunities, and quite often regulations that create this opportunity. And out of that mix, you can pretty well identify what's going to be growing in three, five years time. That five, 10 years time, it might be a little tricky. And I mean, I like to take this step back and use this, this perspective sometimes. And a couple of uh, sources of information, number of renowned consulting companies provide you with these reports. Obviously, some of that is overestimated, but if you look on the whole, had some pretty obvious markets uh, perspective, considering demand, changing regulations, you can make safe bets that some things will grow in one, one way on, or the, uh, the other. For, for instance, take this, something I call that it's going to be SME inclusion in developing countries. I mean, you have entrepreneurial people all over the world, everywhere. Some people just, they have this sense uh, drives to make business better. If you provide them with funding, with financing, they will grow their businesses, which makes total sense both for them and whoever is providing them the money. It's a question, obviously, which of the people are worth Mm -hmm. to be provided with the money, but we'll have more tech for that. We have more, we're betting, getting get better and better with data. There are growing economies and some of them are huge. Like in West Africa, in India, in Pakistan, like people there will look for financial services. And plus, on top of that, governments make it more mm-hmm. feasible to build new financial services. So for, if you combine the, the, all these yes. trends or changes, it's pretty safe bet. We see more and more companies offering SME solutions uh, to clients, to people in this country. And like I said, digital consultancy and net guru of early startups, we also see that demand, you know, rising. So this also helps me to make a judgment. So yeah. 
couple of perspectives and trying to you know, make a sense of these data source. Yes, and I like that, especially like you touched on different pain points as such. You touched on SMEs and you touched on Africa. Then the other day that we spoke, we you talk about the younger generation. So what do you think? Let's go through each of them. I would love to explore mm -hmm. like the pain points that we should be thinking about now for each of these segments that are now underserved as such. So let's start with the Middle East and Africa. What are the pain points that you see uh, that are underserved that something like open finance can help with? I mean, there are many countries, they, they differ, but in very general, I would say that the thing that I mentioned, having underserved communities, but even a pain point, you're losing the opportunity to leverage all social groups to provide them with means of storing money safely, right? Uh, the cost of payment is high. The cost of sending money abroad is super high. Uh, so it's even more than a pain point. It's a major problem. And some of these countries are uh, trying to tackle that or even more to enable access to banking services, data services. You had the podcast a few days back on open finance and it was great to listen to it and, and have it explained. So the open finance is also about making data available to build new services. And it, it, it's an opportunity, especially, I guess, in Saudi Arabia, they're pushing really hard on that to make finance, financial services available to other companies, to fintech, to startups, to developing economies. So I would say that it's not that much of a pain point, but it pieces that if it's cured, there's going to be room for growth. Right? So right now, companies cannot access fully financial services and they're limited and the cost of them is high. If they're able to unlock it, well, economy will thrive, new companies will really push it up and will leverage. Underserved communities, as I said, that's... It's also a moral issue because if you think of the people who don't, first place, they have little money, but then on top of it, they are not able to store this money securely, especially in some countries, it also impacts women. Like for instance, in Pakistan, I think that one in 20 women has access to financial services. This means that 19 are dependent wow, on someone that else. Is, that's huge. Like, to, to have an account where you can safely store your money, right? So if you cannot safely store your money, then you just will just ask your husband or you need to hide that somewhere. So yeah, yes, try to impacts. save some money, but then there is a risk that can be easily taken away from you. So underserved communities, they exist uh, in a number of places all over the, the globe. And it would be great to have that solved. It's improving. A few years back, I think the data was about 2 billion adults uh, without access to like a safe bank account. It's been decreasing, but it's still like more than a billion. Yeah, it is just a make problem, but fintechs are solving that, right? If you look you know, in many countries, uh, that progress is driven by fintechs. I see that in Africa where fintechs are improving the access to financial services for different communities, which is great. I mean, they still make money on it, it's business, but it's also big picture, I would say is positive. Yes. So uh, it's like just to build on that, or maybe like to change the topic a little bit. The other area that we discussed and I am not knowledgeable about, <laughs> I don't have teenagers to look after. But then we were talking about your kids the other day and we were like, hey, the Roblox generation, hey, the alpha generation. And we need to start thinking about them now for when they are like old teenagers slash early adults. What can you tell us about them? I've learned that future generations, they're way more open to new things that we will deliver, create and build. So it's always good to have them as, a, well, to some extent, North Star, what's going to be in demand in the future. Like if you look at you know, general products or Snapchat, tick, these apps started initially with more of a younger generation 
and then expanded to some extent. I mean, I'm still avoiding TikTok, but it's, it's probably in a lower age groups, but it's a great place to start that young generations. And in banking and fintech, it's even more of that because there is a moment where you need to start using financial services sometime in your life. Like if you're eight, 10 years old, you don't use much of financial services. Although banks have quite recently noticed that it's an important segment both for the future and for the parents, those banking parents app. But that's about trying to engage kids in a similar way as they as it used to be in the past. Let give them a banking app. They're going to be doing the banking as their parents were. Maybe we can have this fancy little animals or Pokemon or something like that. So they enjoy that again, uh, which is totally fine. But there's going to be also something different. Each generation should surprise us. And looking at people who are called, uh, right now are sometimes called alpha generation, really young, they're early teenagers. Well, they have different habits. For instance, uh, Metaverse is considered one of the potential big game changers in terms of communication channels, digital services. Uh, you might have heard that, well, Facebook is no longer Facebook. The Facebook group is called Meta because my Zuckerberg assumes Metaverse is going to be the future and maybe we're going to be wearing a helmet or something like that. Maybe yes, maybe no. I, I don't know. He, he's spending billions on that. He may be better informed, but sometimes they make wrong bets. But that Metaverse thing is something I consider should be regarded as potential changes for payment industry, for finance industry. And it's not only me. I mean, official, for instance, that HSBC, you know, a super old traditional bank, the biggest bank in Europe, they have this Horizon 3 perspective, five, 10 years, and mm. Metaverse is on the radar. Biggest banks consider it's going to be big, and it's something you should have on the right. Why is that, right? Cool. Then when you look at all these young generations, then they spend time in platforms, Roblox or Minecraft or Fortnite. Not that much play games, but also to meet, to interact. So I had this, I'll share a story with you. So when, once I, I went to my daughter's uh, room to, to get something and I see she's spending time in Roblox, that's like Minecraft or something like that. similar, an environment when you use avatars to interact with other people and they are having a bonfire. Yeah. And I was like, what are you guys doing? Right. It doesn't make sense. You, so it's you, a bonfire you, of avatars. Yeah. Avatars sitting around the fireplace and having this grilling as sausages and I asked her, like, what are you doing? Who are you sitting there with? Well, I'm sitting there with John, Patrick, and Maya, who I met on camping last summer, and we were having on fire then on camping. Now we're not on camping, obviously, so we thought we were going to recreate it and meet in this You're metaverse. Sure. So if you think of it, like, if this happens and people get used to combining interactions as we do with social media, right? We met in person, we had a peer, but then we keep contact on LinkedIn. So these channels interact. If Metaverse will be another channel that's going to be important for this new generation, and they're already doing it. So maybe they'll be buying things in that Metaverse. These could be digital things and they need to store them and they need to pay for them somewhere. Interesting. And actually, they're making money. You can make money in Roblox. You can make games and make people there's a creator economy. So it's like there's going to be economy inside these metaverse platforms. And if there's economy, guess what? I need financial services. So that can be a thing. Of course. So talking about those economies within the platforms. So who could sell the services and what type of services would they sell? What's your view? Well, the big question is if this platform is an open economy or a closed um, economy, because we can oh. have a model yeah, where you just have to pay for everything and it's closed. You can, the company can control the, mm. uh, the money, the coins or whatever it's used, or it can be open. So it's interchangeable. You can buy, for instance, clothes in one 
uh, create things or digital clothes, clothes or uh, any type of assets in that platform game. Okay? And then perhaps you can trade it outside that game. So I would be selling to you uh, shoes you could use in Roblox that I've created and I would be sh sh selling them here. Or Nike could be selling shoes that would have digital tweets. You would be buying your running shoes, but also a shoe of wherever it comes. So it could be interesting. What they're saying is in a distant future, let's say five to 10 years time, instead of me recording the podcast like we're doing, we could meet in the metaverse and then I could buy my outfit for the metaverse. And then not only I could do that, but let's say if I buy that blouse, I could buy the digital twin of the blouse so that I can wear that in my interview. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Maybe it's, we'll start I don't know if it's the other way. Effective and if it's cost effective, but it's kind of cool. What do you Plus, mean the other if, way? Yeah. I mean... Because initially I've been thinking that you'll be buying proper shoes and then getting like a digital twin of the district, but maybe it's going to work the other way around. You'll go, we'll go meet on this interview in the metaverse and I'll consider getting a new shirt for that interview and I'll buy it in the metaverse. The next week, a real one will come to my apartment by mail, right? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you just expanded our brains. Thank you, Pavel. <laughs> okay, so that was about the future of financial services and some things that we need to think about. Let's move a little bit towards product leadership and product culture as such. We people in product, we know that building a feature or building an app is not enough. We need to build something that's different and something that gives us a competitive advantage. Can you expand, like, what is your way or your process of finding what is that competitive advantage? So having uh, that background I mentioned in research, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm pretty heavily uh, leaning on the research methods to look for competitive advantage. So. What are the expectations? What areas are covered by players in the market? And then looking for um, free spots and opportunities that, you know, that you could try to address. I think that I also want to refer back to what I mentioned about you know, reading what the users want, not necessarily directly what they want, but finding the, the bigger value behind what they're asking for. So as I mentioned, not necessarily they will tell you about the contactless payments. It's up to you to build that solution, but they want fast and uh, safe, secure ways of paying. So you can achieve that in a number of ways. It's finding that competitive advantage is on one hand, being able to listen to the users, not necessarily directly, but what's under underlying needs they have. And then making this creative, great part of the job descriptions that, that we do, creating product, being creative and finding a way, technologies to address that client demands, client need they mentioned. Thank you, Pavel. As product people, like one of our jobs is to create a culture of innovation, to come up with new ideas, different perspectives, to be open-minded. Huh? do we go about creating that culture and creating that mindset across the organization? What's your secret sauce? Uh, I would say that the, the part that I've learned can be underestimated. It's about being humble to the people who've been in, especially if you're in a bigger company. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And I've been in this role trying to build, improve innovation in well-established companies. You need to be humble about the people who are already here Perhaps you need to change their way of thinking, but this does not uh, entitle you to show a hint that you don't have respect for what have been, they've been doing. Like the worst thing that can happen, and it does happen, literally, I've seen it happen. You can close your innovation team in a crystal tower, you know, in a super innovative lab and expect that it's going to transform the company. And I would say that it's the last thing that will work. You need to have that team of people who are more open-minded, thinking, uh, future thinking and that type of stuff, thinking how to change the product. You need to in inject these 
teams, the, the type of talents into the company and them to evangelize, change the product, support them. Obviously, you need that stakeholder support. So I would say that my secret sauce, what I would say, encourage is to inject the skills, methodologies, approach as in as many as possible parts of the company and push people to work together on various workshops, planning and moving forward with the product. Agile, fast and reasonably right, cost effective iterations. So that's my secret sauce. And actually the, the one thing I would like people to remember is to be humble when you're innovating, even if you know that you're changing it for the better. I love that. And I think I haven't heard that perspective. When we talk about innovation, it's like, oh yeah, this methodology, be open-minded, try this, iterate, yeah. this, the other. <laughs> we can, so, we do it. We have this great idea. Humble. We'll change it. And then, first of all, even if you write, you're not building supporters for your idea with that approach, people will be pushed back. And you don't want this, obviously, teams change the world, mm -hmm. not individuals. Plus, you may be missing out something. I mean, the people yes. who has been for longer, maybe they know that it's not possible because, I don't know, there is some regulation that will mess up your whole, whole idea and then you can make full out of yourself. Yeah. I think that's a key message. It hits strong, like just be humble and then basically work together in that environment. Yeah. I, I, I wonder how this differs between cultures. Some culture have for them, it's like some business cultures for them, it's easier to be humble and have respect for people who've been there longer. And some are just like, Hey, we're going to change this. Dam, dam, dam. And then you can end up with total mess take over a huge social media company and six months later it's a mess right and you need to change its name yeah that is very true well it's different cultures different approaches different leaders and personalities which talking about different that takes me to diversity which is so important especially when it comes to building product and innovation well and to me for everything what do you think are the practical actions that we can take as an industry to make it better like for women, minorities, and to have more diversity. Mm, to, to, to say something new, because we, you know, we probably heard lots of uh, comments to balance the teams, which is obviously true, but I want to recall, the, refer back to the podcast I heard last weekend, I think it was by Indicator by Planet Money. I, I do recommend that one. And they were looking into some data as for diversity, in particular, diversity and supporting well different approach to moms and dads when they're working so this scientist in the u.s she sent out an email message to thousands of schools in the u.s asking them to contact i mean she pretended that she the parents are sending the email and they were asking school to contact to call them back and there was a number to john and Mary or like to dad and to mom and guess who would be called right? who would schools call more often yeah so what, it turned out that I think 40% of more often mom would be called and they uh, they pointed out that moms get distracted more often in, by the system and also like for dads it's easier to work professionally and have kids because they have fewer distractions. And it's so I would say maybe link something new to the diversity discussion. Uh, consider like, aren't you treating dads in your company in a different way that you're treating moms in your company? Yeah. Maybe you should, I mean, I've been making that mistake with some of, of my friends, like oh, mom, okay, maybe you want to take, go home early and take care of your kids. But I would never ask that, uh, well, maybe I would now, but I, I would not be fair with my colleagues who have kids and I would not think of them like that. You're a dad, maybe you want to go home and be, take care of your kid. So yeah, parenthood is something that may make a difference and maybe it's good to consider when you're planning your diversity approach. I absolutely love that approach, Pavel. Thank you. I think it's a very practical thing to do. 
reconsidered your parenthood approach in the workplace and how you treat women and men different because of gender when it comes yeah, to parenthood slash motherhood. That's a big, I mean, big lesson. They both have kids usually, right? There's a mom and dad in most of the cases. So both of them yeah. be treated the same way. Yes, I like that. Thank you. So it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Pavel. Where can we find you and Edgar? Well, as for NetGuru, we have a great website and it's the best place to learn what we are doing. For myself, the best way to find me is obviously LinkedIn. I try to make it interesting, uh, share some thoughts and about technology, financial services, but not in a boring way. So every couple of days I share some posts, sometimes articles. Please follow me. Let me know if you like to reach out or I have some questions. I love meeting people in social media on LinkedIn and having some discussions. Awesome. Thank you, Pavel. And I'll definitely add all your details in the show notes so people can reach out and ask more about Alpha Generations, the future of banking in 2030, motherhood and parenthood, how we change that and product in general. It's been a pleasure, Pavel. Thank you so much.